Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our lecture nine on accelerators and graphical processing units. And this is of course in more ways than one a very interesting lecture because this really shakes a bit the computing we know since 20 years where CPUs dominated the market. We had always a clock speed increase, better processors and so forth and suddenly we had this graphical processing units which have been used for general purpose computing. So things that came out of gaming actually influenced also high performance computing and we will talk about it throughout this lectures and then we'll also make the connections why we call it more generally perhaps nowadays accelerator and why we also have now an interesting time because essentially we see a move from a dominant market share from NVIDIA uh, GPUs uh, also to no G NVIDIA GPUs, which basically includes AMDs and also other ideas in Europe. But before we dive into the material of that lecture, let us review a little bit what we had the last time. And the lecture eight was really about a very more or less conceptual topic about debugging, profiling and performance analysis. However, we have seen, and it is here very good visible on these slides, that this is also dominated more or less by really practical tools. So whenever you want to debug and profile actually a, a real highly scalable code, you need automated tooling. We're not talking about this interesting, you know, demo setup here of having just, let's say, 16 ranks and you want to have the communication behavior better understood, or you have the, this is 16 ranks and here the code traces, the stack trace, call path, and, and so on, and the variable values, and so on. Think about you would run, let's say, 10,024 uh, CPU jobs, or even more, like we have seen in Juvels now in the booster, uh, in one of the lectures, Europe's number one system, uh, you can use very, very highly scalable codes. And with this, in order to understand this codes better, you really need this automated tooling. Now we also learned in the last lecture that essentially when you um, actually create applications, you have a constant circle. And this is basically saying that when you have so-called an application and you think it's optimized and you do a measurement and then there are performance analysis tools that maybe help you in, along the way in order to do better tuning. And then once you apply the tuning, you have again a further optimized application, but still it makes sense to do further measurements and to do performance analysis again. And this is an iterative cycle, really a process that many of the application scientists go to when you actually really scale up to, to really high number of cores. And of course, think about that here in Jülich or basically in Barcelona supercomputing centers and around the world in Finland, with a Lumi system. So all of them running workshops that maybe are three, four days or even a whole week of just, you know, analyzing the application behavior with performance analysis tools. You have learned the last time as well. You have learned score P as an underlying way of really measuring, performing traces, performing analysis. And once you do a performance analysis of sorts, you get some interesting results you can form into insights how to better your application. In order to achieve this, the profiling interface of MPI that you see here on the left-hand side was one of the key ingredients on the lowest level. A bit dry topic, so to speak, but the key benefit to take away, I think, is that in a sense, you have still your normal application based on MPI sent and receives and broadcasts and whatever, but of course, the profiling interface um, then basically mimics the way how you have this and basically reroutes essentially these calls in order to enable you to do some elements in this profiling. And we have seen it could be counters of sorts, how often was one specific uh, function actually called, or you do your own element to the, let's say, profiling. But in the end, this is what the cutting edge, let's say, performance analysis tools are leveraging in order to find out then in this analysis here that we have, uh, where is actually the, the location in the code? What is the call path essentially directly in the, uh, in the real, you know, kind of application that you have? And then what property essentially saying also 
uh, what is the metric here where I think there's a late receiver, a late sender, an early reduce, the performance problem I really face. And we have seen Skalaska here with this cube uh, GUI really as one tool doing it, but we have seen Vampire, we have many others like Tau or so um, that are also doing this performance analysis. And all of them have their unique selling proposition and are really still used on daily practice in supercomputing centers today. We have also Skalaska in installed, but it would be perhaps a little bit overkill to use that with your phishing application, um, which is perhaps maximum of 16 or 25 cores or so, so don't worry about this. But still in a very practical problem where you have 512,024 and more processors, you really would start using these tools in order to understand problems in your code much better. And of course here, um, this was just a very short insight into this topic. And we have been going through the metrics quite fast because again, the motivation was firstly, you need these tools because um, it, there's really a lot of benefits and gains to do this automated performance analysis. And then the second is that, you know, there are always these common problems that we have seen with doing a for loop and broadcast, although you can do an all gather, for example, um, and there are lots of that see lessons learned that you really can learn from experienced scientists. <clears throat> but today we go one step further, which is essentially again a practical topic. So we will dive into this a little bit more also um, in lecture 10 and then in lecture 10.1. That's why we basically see this as a practical topic. Although we start with a general introduction of graphical processing units today to make you a bit more aware What's now the difference? Because in the beginning, I was talking roughly about many core processors and multi-core processors. So by now, you know the difference of that. But let us dive now into the world of many core processors and how you program them. Because this is also, again, different from what we learned with MPI. It's different from what we learned with OpenMP. However, the idea of parallelization fundamentals, the conceptual aspects here you learned, in a way stay the same. Of course, we want to have still a high number of cores doing work in parallel and sharing work. And here the graphical processing units are a very good example of those, which is, for instance, leverages, uh, leveraged a lot in parallel and scalable machine learning. That's why we continue with this directly next week when we talk about this application area. And then you can come up to to further other, let's say, application fields where we have some practical insights for you to share. So today, we will start off reflecting a little bit what you learned already with multi-core versus many core ships and what is really the impact of the top supercomputers we have today. Then we reflect a bit on the terminology and NVIDIA architectures, which are known like Kepler, Pascal, Volta, and the newest one, which is Ampere. And we take some of the really top supercomputers in the world, which is one of the summit HPC systems, for instance, we're going to pick out of all of those in order to understand a little bit of really concrete setup of using six GPUs per node. So a very powerful system, really. And why basically you can use these GPUs especially nicely together since they have a specific link that interconnects them, which is NV link and NV switches which are in a way represent a so-called island. I will make a case about why we call it an island. And then a more modern, let's say, a research area, this GPU direct interfaces and actually what you can do in terms of GPUs here in Iceland. The second part then <clears throat> should stimulate a little bit the movement of GPUs. So think about that CPUs where have been always there, where always general purpose computing suddenly GPUs were around and all the different libraries have to be slowly transformed. So we see a, a strong movement that many of the simulation sciences libraries, and I provide you here with very common examples like the BLAS or basic, basic linear algebra libraries, so to speak, that are actually moving to adopting the idea how GPUs are programmed. And then we basically learn a little bit about how you program them in a very specific area of NVIDIA GPUs with the so-called CUDA. But of course, we see also in the future with AMD Instinct cards, uh, not only in Lumi in Europe, but also in Frontier in US and many other new vendors appearing that also now introduced actually 
into these, um, you know, accelerator market could really make a difference because now we see really a market dominance of NVIDIA with high costs of GPUs today. But of course, here there's a chance that over the time that we have now competition in this field, there could be also cost reductions over the long run. Um, given this situation that we face now more and more accelerators, of course, the, the stress is on the developers. So you would say here we would have now the problem that the developers have to implement in CUDA. They have to implement in ROC toolkits for AMD. They have to implement this and that for different vendors. Hence, there's a need for standardization, so to speak, of these accelerators, which in one way or another is represented by OpenEC and the so-called HIP standard I will talk about in the second part. However, uh, take away the message that from practical insights, of course, still using, for instance, NVIDIA GPUs with really nickel and low leveling libraries um, that are really optimized for, let's say, machine learning and so on is still hard to beat when you want to program your applications. And we will talk about it also in the subsequent lecture 10 when we talk about machine learning and deep learning and why TensorFlow and you know Tensor cores then supported by GPUs on top of this uh, really make a big difference. So we have a slow introduction here today and then over the course run of the next couple of lectures, we will always make the connection why GPUs now of course are a very important part in the field and again, here goes the disclaimer. Um, in one way, you would say I could really teach uh, GPUs as a full course today. Uh, GPUs is really a topic which, um, you know, fills easily a whole week from morning till evening uh, lecture series in one of our centers. And then you can go on and using them, let's say, with new libraries, which are not only for machine learning, also the traditional physics libraries like Amber, for instance, or so are all now being ported here and there to GPU versions and actually then also show some benefits. Now, <clears throat> the learning outcomes and really out of this is that you have another complex aspect of parallel programming uh, tackled, which is the world of accelerators. And chances are, if you do jobs now and search for jobs in basically the realm of HPC, you would have accelerators, GPUs, GP, GPUs, as they're sometimes called general purpose graphical processing units, and with CUDA and all of that, what we will learn through the course also to understand why the device memory needs to be fueled by the host memory and these steps of really giving data, so to speak, to the accelerators uh, enables you to really support your programming in this interesting new environment tools by not using only distributed memory and shared memory that we start off in the course, which are very traditional, but by making, you know, or taking advantage really from accelerators. And this is really a HPC programming paradigm these days. You will still see that the way how you use accelerators in a way is deeply connected to high throughput and uh, doing the same operations, but just for many, many, many different cores. So in one way, it also connects to established programming paradigms that you will see. So let's start with general purpose graphical processing units. And here I can, of course, connect what we learned in lecture one. Um, we know that the multi-core CPU processor, that's the one that you basically should know has a very high heartbeat, high clock frequency, high single thread performance. That's a working horse, right? There are a couple of cores which are really strong. They have a cache hierarchies. Um, and that's by now you already know that this is, of course, um, very, very powerful and shows perhaps the best performance. But on the other hand, we know due to the heat limitation, we cannot increase in this. So you're always bound to to a certain number of cores in a certain clock speed, because otherwise you will have bit errors. You will overheat the chip and it will break. Hence, we learned there was the idea of now introducing this many core chips that many of you perhaps really early in your life have already experienced without really ever considering that this is now more general purpose computing. So many of us, including you as students, probably have started with something like the NVIDIA GeForce, the gaming industry, um, which basically have started with very early versions of basically GPUs, which are optimized for gaming. And this was the origin of the context that we're talking about. So the idea of using basically for rendering of scenes, for basically doing very specific elements for graphics, 
um, has offs also for general purpose programming. So using this many core processors, which you have here in the device that we call the accelerator here, the GPU as an example, means we have many of these different processors. Uh, and we know that already from previous um, lectures that these are not the ones with high single thread performance. Here we have rather moderate, let's say, performance. But the benefit is having thousands of those that can make a difference. However, the drawback we also learned is it is always fueled via the main memory, and I will show you today a little bit more about this in a stepwise walkthrough. However, the, the beauty really of this GPU is it's excellent for data parallelism and task parallelism throughput. So in order to do the same operation, let's say for, for basically a lot of numbers of in parallelization, the GPU is just basically a perfect architecture that you can you know, push through hundreds or even thousands of very simple cores to executing some threads which you need. And although it's basically now actually used for general purpose, it has its uh, basically origin in gaming, which is an interesting element to see. And basically today we have very specific GPU architectures for very specific purposes. So it is a development which is quite interesting Although those GPUs which are for gaming are not directly those which we see in the HPC machines, the general concept of the GPU, of course, remains the same. So, and we have seen a little bit of how this works already in one of the earlier lectures with the CPU acceleration of sorts, so meaning really accelerate a certain code for a certain specific problem. And here we see one example of this, which is a so-called Amber uh, package, which is, you know, basically leveraging the GPUs now um, by doing atom, uh, basically simulations. You can use Amber for different elements. Here you have a protein, for instance. But the the key message to take away is here basically the different versions of having a V100 card maybe here, but having also um, basically here the different, uh, you know, versions of, of different GPUs and different, um, you know, evolutions of those. And <clears throat> that also shows you that essentially um, we have now a situation where even strong scientific packages from the past, like Ember, it was around in scientific computing since a long time, are being ported essentially to GPUs and basically see that with this um, kind of, you know, basically 2,492 atoms here on different GPUs, you can really do a benchmark that these are actually also getting better and better these days. And actually the Pascal here that you see um, essentially, and here the Volters and Kepler's in the past, now we have even Ampere as a new architecture. So it keeps on generally to do more evolutions. We see more and more threats that are possible on GPUs today not only this example. And here's one of the, let's say, cutting edge um, GPU that you have today. It's called NVIDIA A100. And the Tensor Core GPU refers to a specific version of it, which is, let's say, a little bit also optimized for doing basically um, deep learning at scale. And you see here a little bit the time per thousand iterations and the performance that you can really get out of this different generations, why the Volta 100 was the cutting edge for a long time. We basically see here um, in training of AI models and largest models, the relative performance of basically using now with the newest A100 cards and let's say lots of um, memory with it, uh, is significant proof again of having three times as much performance. And if you want to know more about the A100, of course, the white paper gives much more and I don't want to have the whole lecture much more as an NVIDIA marketing lecture. That's why I refer to this white paper, just focusing more a little bit on the basics, how such, a, let's say, a CUDA core really looks like. Um, you basically have here a CUDA core, which is a very simple core, as we discussed. But the point is here, you have very many of it. And you see also that essentially the architecture is a little bit different from what you learn basically from the CPU architecture and uh, essentially doing lots of different operations really in a similar manner, but through all of these different cores. And in a way, you see here the evolution of those, um, for instance, towards the Volta architecture, as I say, now the Ampere is really 
the most cutting edge of it. Still, you see, it was a long way in the last, let's say, uh, 10 to actually more 15 years now, maybe, uh, where people have started to look into this kind of accelerator business. And there was first an Intel architecture as well that was working on the Xeon architecture with more or less CPUs, also with a promise here and there to to later maybe, you know, with, with Intel Xeon Pi's and the Xeon CPUs and so on, to host a little bit, um, let's say, or in other words, to, to be at the same time an accelerator and a host CPU. And of course, this, this would have been quite interesting, but it was stopped at some point in time. So today, really, we see more or less that's therefore the market dominance of NVIDIA. So also, you see that NVIDIA is not the only player in the game. Um, we have here the AMD Radeon GPUs, which is also, let's say, nowadays coming much more prominent as one of the competitors now for NVIDIA. Um, showing promising, let's say, adoption areas now. We see more and more supercomputing uh, resources really use AMD cards and are really um, basically working on this. Also in Jülich, here in the supercomputing center, we have now a couple of them to really do the first experiments and the baby steps. That really means to understand how we move away from CUDA to more general setups and basically how we take and leverage then accelerators which are more AMD ready on GPUs. Still, you see also that the performance in generally, of course, gets higher and higher, which is a big benefit for us in science and engineering computing with HPC. And actually here we are just at the Volta 100. Uh, you can imagine that the Ampere 100 is also now much higher here. <clears throat> and the impact really, when you look at concrete systems, you see here the summit system, for instance, um, which is still top number two in the world given November 2021 and our list at that time. There will be a new list in June 2022, but there will be perhaps not too many changes to this list. But you see here V100 cards, um, so it's not even the most cutting edge cards. But the interesting thing in summit, which we will release and will look a little bit into is it has six um, of those per node. And if you compare it to our Europe number one system that we host in Jülich at the supercomputing center, uh, we have A100 cards, so the really cutting edge of those, but we have, let's say, just four uh, in one node. But of course, nicely, we have then 936 compute nodes, which makes it overall to, you know, 3.7 thousand GPUs that you can use in the system. When we look more into HPC number one machine summit then with many core GPUs um, as in November here, 2019 example, it doesn't really matter from the time, so to speak, but you see a very powerful system that you know is also still really on the top, essentially of the top 500 system. And how you would basically see and look at this is a very complicated architecture with having, let's say, um, different, you know, multi-core chips with Power9 EBM CPUs as an example from Intel. And of course, Intel in terms of CPUs is definitely still the market share here with 95%. But then you have seen NVIDIA is really entering the market on the accelerator business. And the interesting thing in the summit system here that you have here on the picture is it's not only very huge, you can imagine many racks, many GPUs and processors, it also has six NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs per node. And this is quite unique. And of course, here you can imagine that also the interconnect is very strong between all of these different nodes. Here we talk about Mellanox, Dual Rail, EDI, InfiniBand. So a very, let's say, low latency network as well. Um, of course, the memory is important as well. Um, and some, you know, elements also to just think about um, the size of all of this, right? When we think it's 4,608 nodes um, that have all this set up. And then basically the, the overall size is like two tennis courts to give you essentially the idea um, what's not visible here, but that it's this is a very huge system and uh, interesting system in Oak Ridge in the US. Um, that is, of course, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world right now. So architecturally, we can look into this a little bit more into detail. 
And what you find is what I said earlier, that of course the host CPUs are very relevant because they fuel the GPU with data. Um, and you see here a typical, let's say, multi-core CPU interconnected and so on, having also certain amounts of RAM. But each of those GPUs, as we said, when we have this node here, we said we have this two times, um, you know, CPUs. Um, so we have here basically these two chips and each of those attach three GPUs. And these GPUs also have their own memory, right? The device memory, which is called HBM in the version two. And this is a very powerful memory as well. Um, and the NV link that you see a little bit here, um, alluding to this kind of GPU interconnect also is a very nice interconnect between the GPUs to use them in parallel with 50 gigabytes per second. And you have a more conceptual view here, um, essentially from the node architecture with all the different bandwidth that you can see. And I think one of the important aspects to take away is really this 900 gigabyte per second bandwidth between the GPU and the HBM memory, right? So again, think about here, we talk about 900 GB per second, while perhaps, you know, CPUs and others like uh, the NB link and so on, they have just 50 GB, um, gigabytes per second, or essentially here the access to the RAM that you see is 170 gigabytes per second. So here we talk about the order of magnitude access to data, which we need as a GPU, right? And what is in a way also partly a bottleneck today. So it's not anymore a bottleneck that the GPU can access data. It's rather a bottleneck how we fuel this HPM with enough data from the processors via the whole CPU in order to provide them data enough to compute enough. And in a way that also triggers new developments, because essentially, of course, the HBM is very strong. And uh, basically, there is lots of standardization going on that essentially here, the the access to this accelerator is basically um, really a lot, a lot of limiting in this kind of factors that it cannot fuel the accelerator um, enough or quick enough as new data sets, because essentially the CPU connection to the accelerator is basically uh, here the trouble. So there are ideas to think about rather how we can communicate from accelerator to accelerator to avoid this problem and this bottleneck. And there are standards actually um, that also have standards here on HPM and memory um, in this specific area. And um, essentially, we see that um, this HBM is not an NVIDIA element. It's really also used in other um, accelerators and can be used in other, other, uh, other accelerators as well. So looking a little bit at Volta, um, and you basically see the difference here between Pascal, the previous generation, and then suddenly the Volta tensor cores is 12 times more throughput. Um, also, when you think about mixed precision, like floating point 16 versus let's say double position FP32 or so, uh, we see that actually the lower one is actually better for deep learning because it is a regular Ryzen effect in a way a bit. So meaning that by having more throughput, you are much more faster and don't need the details in the end um, that you had previously because here you enable it now, um, let's say rather the throughput and the totally details are basically often cut with regularization in deep learning, for instance, or in artificial neural networks anyway, in order to basically learn better and to generalize better out of sample. But these are elements which we have then in, in lecture 10 and lecture, uh, no, practical lecture 10.1. You also see here again, the generations from the Kepler architecture, K80s were often used in the past and we see at the time to solution just with the new architectures and deep learning training, uh, we can reduce from 44 hours, really over 18 hours in the Pascal architecture with the Volta today. And as I said, also today, we have even a 100 cards where much more performance is also possible. You also see the amount of thousands of cores now that a V100, for instance, has, right? Uh, so it's about 5,000 CUDA cores and then specific tensor cores on top of it. And we will look into this a bit more deeper, deeper when we then compare here, let's say really the 
the kind of um, training of a so-called ResNet 50 that you see here a little bit, um, which is basically cutting edge deep learning um, that you can do. And my PhD student will actually talk about this also in lecture 10.1 when we connect it to some of our remote sensing applications. So the interconnection, however, of GPUs in order to enable this parallel training, so to speak, and parallel use of GPUs is an important part to see because here we see also certain limitations again of the so-called islands, right? So we have this NV links, which obviously is very good. It's a high speed direct GP GPU interconnect that we can basically use with six GPUs in parallel, um, where basically um, you can, can then use them for, let's say, training deep learning networks or to use them in applications, um, you know, in, to, together really to solve a problem. And then you can have an NV switch, which is basically uh, connecting different of those NV links um, to enable then this GPU communication, all to all communication, but it's restricted to a single node because they don't really scale to workloads to a full HPC machine like we basically now researching a little bit by using the so-called GPU direct interface. So the scaling of this, if you want to do large scale computing is something um, which is still a question mark. And hence we were basically researching this a little bit in the deep project in Europe, how we can basically um, go better in this kind of scaling and what we can do about it. And the idea is really, for instance, in the booster here to use different GPUs still, but somehow making a different installation of the systems by, by passing, so to speak, the NVLink and NV switches uh, in a certain perspective. And this was, of course, still, let's say, matter of research <clears throat> recently, where essentially you have heard about the drawback already from me, where you say, basically, we cannot fuel quickly enough here, maybe the accelerators anymore with data. And here, this is a bottleneck in general. So instead of going from the accelerator via the device CPU, uh, via the host CPU, and then to another host CPU, and then again to a device GPU and so on, why not basically thinking about, instead of doing this conventional offloading, right, that you see here, that I just explained, and we will look later in this lecture also in more detail, that you have the host CPU, it loads up data, executes a kernel, the results come back, you have MPI, and then basically distributing this, and then you basically load up the data again, and then do some other things. So this is a conventional way how you would use it today. But what about if you use a host CPU, more or less more like a network interface, right, to go beyond these limits and say you directly communicate essentially the results out with MPI to the next core and would directly with GPU in um, get into the kernel space again. So you bypass the host CPU, essentially saying that the host CPU is not doing any computing anymore. It's actually more or less a network interface doing the MPI and the rest is done with the computing and the kernels here that you have in the GPU. And these are concepts which are, let's say, ongoing research uh, in practice. And what you then can apply in some of the different, let's say, modules we learned already as a, let's say, prototype system, where, for instance, a dumb prototype could also leverage these systems, perhaps in the past, uh, in the future, as in the past, by exploring how this technology can work, but also the extreme scale booster can be actually perhaps using these, let's say, research outputs. Still, NVLink and NVSwitch are, of course, used and are very powerful and should be not mistaken now um, in basically saying um, that this is not good technology. The question is also partly in, in deep learning and so on, do you really always need to scale to the big machine completely? While some of my PhDs, of course, they scale to 128 GPUs or even more these days. Um, the question is if you know the majority of all the applications really require that. Now coming to Iceland, just a little bit, um, we have here also in Iceland uh, one Tesla Volta V100 per node. We have Tesla M card still in one of the queues. Um, this is a GAPUR system that you have here basically visible. Um, it's one of our production systems in Iceland. So it's not the UTIN system that you know for your experiments or for your assignments, which is more or less a teaching cluster. Here we talk about a production system.
still compared to Ulic, of course, a, let's say smaller uh, production system, but in the end, uh, nevertheless, one that is used for cutting edge science in chemistry from Hannes Jonsson's team and, you know, um, several others really that use here the system for computational chemistry. And you have also, of course, Vida and others for physics and so on and astrophysics as well. So it's quite used by many groups. And basically also we see here now very soon an increase in GPUs coming uh, with the Icelandic Elia system, which is just basically in the production creation. So people working actively in the uh, UTS department, but also basically with the help of scientists to get the Elia system online. And then we have a much more powerful GPU situation also in Iceland. Through EuroHPC, however, Iceland can also engage in other systems, like for instance, the Lumi system, where we are also a part of in Iceland. But this is elements uh, these are elements actually that I will also talk about in the second part of this lecture. So let us maybe have a very short video now why or basically what the interesting, let's say 10,000 feet perspective is, why GPUs are nowadays quite interesting. And we see here one example by crafting the Mona Lisa. All right, I introduced you Leonardo and he's going to paint a picture for you guys in the way that a CPU might do it, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. In three, two, one. Uh, let me speed it up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Leonardo. <laughs> 2.0. When we hit this trigger on this thing, 2,100 gallons of air goes through these accumulators, out these valves, into all 1,100 of these tubes, into these tubes in which the bottom of is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. GPU <laughs> painting demonstration. Yep. In 10, 9, nine eight, 8, 7, 6, 6 5, 4, 4 3, 2, 1. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, science class is now over. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so that was a more or less um, yeah, interesting and a maybe slightly funny introduction, but it captures essentially the essence of really having the power of GPUs by just having many, 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 uh, let's say in parallel painting this instead of just one sequential, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, CPU. Of course, we have more interesting topics than in the second part of this lecture, uh, where we go to some details of GPU libraries and then really understand a bit better how you're programming those, with also think about some open standards. So see you then. <laughs>